Good morning, everyone. We've just opened up the webinar about a minute ago. We're just going to give it another minute before we get started as uh, we welcome more participants. Thank you. All right, good morning. My name is Heidi Musser and I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Financial Aid and Awards here in Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs. And I'm the moderator for this presentation called Applying for Graduate Scholarships, Insider Academic Advice. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days in case you wish to revisit any of the content presented here today. If you require closed captioning, please click on the show captions button at the bottom of your screen to start viewing closed captioning. This session has been designed because we recognize the importance of ensuring our students are set up for success with applying for graduate scholarships. I'm very pleased to introduce two of our academic colleagues here in GSPA. First, Professor Jeff Casello is the Associate Vice President, Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs, and he is the Chair of our Institutional Scholarship Selection Committee. Over the past seven and a half years or so, Jeff has reviewed hundreds of scholarship applications and has guided our Institutional Selection Committee to adjudicate the applications and determine which students should be awarded a scholarship or which students should be endorsed to the national level competition as appropriate. And we also have Clarence Woodsma. He is one of our new Assistant Vice Presidents, Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Affairs, and a professor in the School of Planning. During our presentation, Jeff will share important tips and suggestions about preparing your scholarship application, with particular emphasis on preparing your research proposal, selecting referees who will write reference letters, the importance of publications and academic contributions, how special circumstances may or may not impact your application, the institutional adjudication process, and other available resources. We encourage you to ask any academic-related questions by typing the question in the Q&A section shown in the bottom of your screen. Following our presentation, Jeff will address as many questions as he can, and he may call upon Clarence to assist and to share any perspectives he may have. If we run out of time and your question has not been answered or you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to your department coordinator or graduate officer or associate chair or supervisor for assistance. And Ashley, if you could please add the links into the chat, that would be great. Uh, assisting us behind the scenes during this presentation are my colleagues Miranda Bellotta, Laura Frizee, and Elena Machado, who manage scholarship competitions here in GSPA as well as Ashley Ryan, who is our graduate and postdoctoral programming specialist. Thank you all for your support and assistance in keeping an eye on the questions that will be coming in. <clears throat> I would also like to make you aware of a couple of other sessions and deadlines that are quickly approaching. First of all, there is a virtual NSER Q&A session tomorrow afternoon, that's September 12th, from 1 to 2.30, where you can ask NSERT reps your questions. And Ashley will add the link to the event in our chat as well. Secondly, there's a tri-agency doctoral scholarship workshop scheduled for September 19th from 4 to 6 p.m. where you can seek ad advice and feedback from faculty members regarding your CV, lay abstract, or research proposal. Registration details for this event can be found on our scholarship competition resources website and Ashley if you could add the link, that would be great. And finally, a reminder that the deadline to order your transcripts for the Tri-Agency Doctoral and Vanier Scholarships is September 13th. If you receive departmental endorsement to apply for the Vanier, uh, September 13th is also the deadline to submit 
your scholarship application within ResearchNet. Again, that is specifically for the Vanier Scholarship. We would appreciate your understanding that a lot of information will be shared today. And although we are subject matter experts, nerves can come into play during a live presentation and an inaccurate detail could be conveyed unintentionally. As such, I encourage you to rely on our, on our and the agency websites as the primary source of information. Finally, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I am a first generation Canadian whose European parents and grandparents settled in Kitchener, Ontario shortly after World War II. Their journey to immigrate to Canada resulted from processes of colonization and the displacement of Indigenous people from their land. In the spirit of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, I commit to learning more about Indigenous histories and realities in order to actively move toward reconciliation. I further acknowledge that my employment with the University of Waterloo takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The main campus on which I work is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, and community building and is coordinated within our Office of Indigenous Relations. So without further delay, I will now turn things over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Heidi, and thanks to the team also for having organized everything and thanks to the hundred or so people who have joined us this morning. It's, um, it's nice to see all of you. Before I jump into the details, let me just reiterate one thing that Heidi said um, about the importance of applying for these graduate scholarships. Um, many of you may already be receiving funding from your supervisor, and as a result, you may be contemplating the value of applying for this kind of scholarship. I'll be honest and say it isn't an easy process. It can be a lot of work. And so what is the extra value associated with holding these kinds of awards? Well, beyond the financial contribution, and I think that's important, but beyond that financial contribution, having been recognized by one of the tri-agencies, whether it's NSERC, SHRC, or CIHR, really can be a career accelerant for you. So if you are in your master's program, or if you are in your PhD program, and you are going and you are awarded one of these um, scholarships, it really is looked upon favorably, particularly in Canada, but increasingly globally um, on your candidacy. So if you're thinking about a research position or you're thinking about a career in industry or you're thinking about an academic position, having held these tri-agency awards, these scholarships is really important for you again, not just for the financial reasons, but also for the reputational credibility that it gives you in the research work that you've already done. So we're really eager to encourage people to apply for these these scholarships again we recognize that it's a, a bit of work um but we think in the end it certainly is of value to you um not just for the finances but also for all of the other uh, ancillary benefits that come along with um, having won this award so i'm going to talk quite a bit today about the mechanics of how to put together a really strong application um that's our intention the goal is at the end of this webinar for you to be in a, a really good spot to put together the strongest presentation of yourself and of your research such that you compete favorably here within the University of Waterloo, but more importantly, across the, the country as we advance some of these um, application packages forward to the national competition. So with that, let's jump into the content. Here's some just general advice about how to write your research proposal. Um, a little bit of it is structural and a little bit of it is in terms of the content. The most important thing I think you can do when you're writing your research proposal is to create a really strong narrative. By that, I mean you have to tell a story in your research proposal. You have to get the reader interested in why your work is going to be exciting, why it's going to be novel, but maybe most importantly, why is it going to be impactful? What is your research going to help us do in the end? Um, doing research for the sake of curiosity is fantastic. Doing research for the sake of curiosity, but also producing outcomes that are going to be of value to society, to your discipline, um, whether you are creating a new fundamental base of knowledge or you're doing something that's very applied, help us understand why it is important, the work that you're doing, okay? Um, in terms of structure, use subheadings. So talk about this from the from first about your um, overarching problem, and then what are the specific research questions, and then what are the methods you're going to use, what are the expected findings. Those are important subheadings that will help the reader make their way through your proposal and feel like it has a really good structure. 
make good use of space. Um, I should say this early, and I'll probably say it a couple more times, but when we get to the place where we are comparing applications, the strength of the applicant and of the applications tends to be very, very high. And what we need, honestly, is differentiating factors, things that have that are better on one application than on others to make the decision between who will go forward and who will not. So making good use of space is an important criterion. It may sound silly, but you should really fill out all of the space that is provided for you on your form. Don't leave lots of white space. On the other hand, don't go for 0.46 line spacing and put so much density into your proposal that we can't read it. So get the balance right. Fill the space, fill it with meaningful content, but don't make it so compact that it becomes difficult or unpleasant to read. If you have an image that can explain a whole lot of text, then you ought to use it. Um, we have I was most recently reading something on magnetic spaces, and there was finally, after 10 or 12 pages, there was a really good image of what the person was trying to convey through really hundreds of words. And so if there is a situation where the image can convey and shorten the amount of text that you need, then you ought to include that. And you ought to do it in a way that is visible. Don't just put a tiny image in that doesn't allow the reader to see it or to understand what you're trying to convey. Really be thoughtful about the, the image and make sure that it is conveying important messages. You can be concise. Try not to use long flowing prose that doesn't add a lot of value. Um, way back when, when I took a writing class, there was something called doodad modifiers that were just these adjectives or adverbs that didn't really add a lot or I intend to explore the possibility of, all of that can be written as I will. And those are good space saving techniques for you and good, um, good practice for you to be concise. Um, I'm gonna jump down a little bit in the next to the last bullet that says use I will rather than I would like to. It's important for the reviewer to have a confidence that you can actually do the work that is embedded in your research proposal. So when you'd say, I would like to, it means, or I aim to, or I will, I intend to, those are all sort of conditional kinds of sentences to say, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. And it's much better for you to be direct and say, I will, or I can achieve, or um, the work will produce, those kinds of things. I think that's an important outcome. So be direct and be confident in your, your capacity. One thing that we really struggle with when we read these research proposals are acronyms and jargon. Now, it can be helpful uh, if rather than writing out a very long sentence or a very long um, um, term over and over again to use an acronym, but make sure you explain those and make sure you only use those that are really important to your work because the reader of this, of your research proposal, is going to have probably an understanding of what you're doing, but they're not gonna be absolutely at the same depth of, of knowledge that you are. So when you are working to write a research proposal, it has to be accessible to the reader and acronyms sometimes help that, but sometimes acronyms hurt that. Jargon is something that really we have to be careful about. Um, I read lots of pure math, lots of physics kinds of applications and the language that is often in those are really, some of the vocabulary that gets presented in those um, in those proposals are really known to a very small subset of the population who are in that discipline. So if you're going to use those acronyms and jargon, you have to help us understand what those things mean. When you are providing references in your um, in your research proposal, um, it's important that the re references that you are adding have scientific credibility. So if you are writing and you are writing about climate change and you are referencing a blog um, that is written by someone who's not a climate scientist, that probably doesn't add much value to your, to your reference list. Um, but if you're quoting a journal that, that has a, a similar point of view, then I think it has a much better um, impact on your overall um, research proposal. The last structural thing I'll say is to make sure that you check your spelling and check your grammar. If English isn't a first language for you, we'll talk about some resources in a minute where you can have those things checked. But a spell check is really important. And remember that a spell check might not always catch things. Um, you might be saying O-N on, and you may have typed O-N-E. The spell check won't find that, but it will be a typographical error. And again, we are trying to differentiate between really excellent applications and those applications that are good, but have some kind of errors. So having spelling and grammar errors can be problematic if they go forward. So I hope that's helpful in terms of the general advice on the research proposal. 
So now getting into maybe a bit more on the content of your research proposal. You have to create this balance between the first, the importance of the question. Why is this research important? Why is it important for society? Why is it important for climate? Why is it important for health? Why is it, what is the, the application of the work that you're doing? And, you know, I know in some disciplines you're doing fundamental work, uh, again, using pure math and physics. Um, you know, even if you are doing foundational work, basic research, there still ought to be some long-term goal about why there will be a, what will be the positive outcomes of gaining the understanding that you are through the fundamental research. So when you set out to write your proposal, start with that big picture. I often um, refer to this as a martini glass, where we start at the top with a really wide goal. My goal is to address our understanding of quantum mechanics. Our goal, my goal is to understand sustainable transportation. My goal is to understand the role of culture and ethnicity in a series of literature that I'm reading. And then as you come down in the martini glass, it gets narrower and narrower. So your focus becomes clearer and clearer. And the individual elements of the work that you're going to do in this big picture is really contained in the stem of that martini glass. And then the base of the martini glass, which is often very wide, can be the way that you expand the work that you've done in this very narrow column to have application beyond just the work that you've done. Okay, so I hope that martini glass concept is helpful for you as you think about your research proposal. So begin with a statement of why it's important. What are you going to do? And then when you start getting into the narrow part of that, of that martini glass, you have to make sure that the reviewer, the person who's reading that, has a confidence of two things. One, that it's realistic for you to do that. If you tell us that you're going to survey 100,000 people in person over the next three months, we're not going to believe that that's possible for you to do. So make sure that the work that you're proposing is realistic. And the second part of this is make sure that you can demonstrate to us that you and your supervisory team have the capacity to do the work that you're proposing. So if your supervisor is a global expert in mathematical methods or in Shakespeare or in physical chemistry, and the work that you're doing is right in that supervisor's wheelhouse, then it's helpful to explain that. And it was also helpful to tell us how your skills match up with your supervisor's skills so that you can do the work. Start with the big picture, narrow it down to the work that you're going to do, talk about what's happening in that STEM, what is the actual work you're going to do, convince us that it's realistic, convince us that you have the skills or the knowledge to do that, and the things that you don't know, you have a committee structure that's going to help you, and then make sure that you tell us again what the impacts of that work is going to be, all right? That's the martini structure of a really well-written research proposal. In cases where your work involves equity-deserving groups, where your work involves Indigenous people, where your work involves Black people, where your work involves those who are women, for example, or those who identify as women, make sure that you make it clear that you are being thoughtful, you are being considerate, you are being purposeful in your consideration of these EDI concerns. And in, in most of our application processes now, there is a section that asks you explicitly about whether or not you are, you are dealing with equity deserving groups, specifically women, persons of color, indigenous, so on. And it's important that you fill that out and you do that in a meaningful way. Maybe the most important part of, a, of an application that gets the least attention is this lay abstract. I think people spend a lot of time on their research proposal, and by the time they're done with their research proposal, they just cut and paste some text and put it into the lay abstract. And for me, that's an unforced error. That's a missed opportunity. The lay abstract is a place where you can add into your overall proposal a succinct and catchy and thoughtful and relevant way to demonstrate your research and it's important to a very lay audience. Imagine that you had an opportunity to go on CBC or your favorite broadcast network here in Canada and tell the people of the world about your work in a way that was going to get them excited. That's what ought to go in the lay abstract. It ought to truly be lay. It ought to be understandable by the joke is of course about your grandmother, but it ought to be ought to be understandable and it ought to gain the attention of a very public audience. So don't just cut and paste from your research proposal into the lay abstract. Take time to write a meaningful, catchy, important, and it should emphasize again, the importance of the work that you're doing. 
One bit of feedback I can give you, this has obtained feedback from your supervisors, from your colleagues, from your peers outside of your discipline. All that is really good advice. But here's what I would suggest you do. Once you have your research proposal and you think it's 95% done, leave it for a day and then send it to some colleagues and or your friends or your supervisor and ask them to read it. Because what will happen is you'll work on this for some time and you'll begin to read things in ways that are consistent with what you're trying to say and it might not actually be what you are saying. And so what you're thinking you're saying in your head as you read your research proposal might not actually be what's written down. And taking a day and having one of your colleagues or your peers read your, your proposal start to finish will do a couple things. It will catch all the spelling mistakes, it'll catch the grammar mistakes, but it'll also tell you if there are any gaps in the logic that is presented in the narrative. You remember I started by saying that you need to be able to tell a story throughout the process. Well, you might be, again, thinking that the story is clear when others read it who don't have your background specifically, who may be in your same field, but don't have your background specifically, they may find those gaps of the knowledge and they may tell you where to fill some things in. And that's a really important outcome. So take the time to do that to get feedback from others. I also want to make you aware of our Writing and Communication Center. This is an enormously valuable resource for our graduate students, not just for writing your research proposals, but for all of your um, communication needs. They are um, available online. They often have pop-up events um, around the campus. You can find them regularly in the Dana Porter Library. Um, I think their offices are in the in South Campus Hall. But make an appointment with the Writing and Communication Center to review a near final draft of your research proposal. They are they have staff in the Writing and Communication Center that have both disciplinary expertise, but are operating at the level of PhDs or graduate students who are making these kinds of research proposals. They support our faculty members as well, so they're really well prepared to provide you input on your overall quality of your research proposal. So just to summarize, I'll go back up for a second. Just to, oops, I'll go back up for a second and tell you, fill the space, fill the space effectively. Use images if they're effective. Don't use images that can't be seen or aren't clear. Avoid the acronyms and jargon. Make sure you're direct in the way that you write. I will, I, in, I, in, I, I can achieve. Um, the research will produce. Don't aim to or intend to. Those are, are un, those are less direct and less strong writing. Make sure your spelling and grammar is correct. Create a balance of the impact of your work, but also how you're going to do that work and what will be the outcomes from your work. Give us a confidence that you can do that. Make sure that we know enough about the work that you're doing, but it's still accessible to someone who may have some background in your discipline, but isn't at the same level of expertise as you are. If you're dealing in an EDI world, make sure you understand and explain why that is relevant. Don't overlook this lay abstract. It's an important outcome for you. It's an important part of your overall research proposal. It can candidly make or break your application. If someone reads the lay abstract and gets excited by your work, they're going to read your proposal with a very different mindset than if they read the lay abstract and say, I don't understand any of that. And then when they get to the proposal, the proposal just reinforces their inability to understand what you're doing. Okay, get feedback from people in your discipline, but from people also out of your discipline so that you have a good sense of the, the quality of the narrative that you've written. I hope all that is helpful for your research proposal. I'm gonna move on and now start talking about your, how to choose referees. When you think about how you want to be presented in your overall application package, you can say so much about yourself and you can talk about your competencies, you can talk about your research capacity, but really in many ways, the referees are there to fill in and to reinforce and to provide a picture to the, uh, to the review committee of what a complete scholar you are. And so think about your relationships with your referees. Um, I know that there is a case where many of you will have very good relationships with multiple faculty members. You can ask them to, provide that reference, and you can have a confidence that they are going to provide for you a very strong and well-rounded um, reference. You should also think about what different aspects of you the referees can talk about. So if you have a faculty member with whom you've worked almost exclusively academically, and you've done some really novel things, and they can talk to you about, uh, talk about your skill set in that space, that's terrific. 
if there's another faculty member who's gotten to know you a little bit personally and can situate your research work in terms of how important it is to you personally, that's also an amazing addition to your overall reference package. And so try to figure out exactly what a referee will bring and how they will reflect your overall competencies, your overall skill sets. Um, it's really helpful to point your referees to the academic criteria or to the selection criteria for these competitions. So what you don't want someone to have someone to do is to be, for example, trying, you need someone to comment on your leadership competencies. And this person writes to say, well, I was their instructor in only one course, so I can't talk much about their academics. That's not helpful. Um, what you really need to be clear is about, I'm asking you to provide this reference because you have knowledge of my competencies in terms of leadership through our experience when we worked on this together or when you were the support for this initiative that I created, right? So give your referees guidance on the parts of your overall package that you hope that they will comment on. It's not out of bounds at all to do that. If you want someone to talk about your research excellence, they ought to be able to do that. If you want someone to talk about that time that you were the first in the course of 200 and you regularly prompted really important discussions and you were seen to be a, a student leader in the course, that's really helpful to remind the, the letter writer that that's what you're asking them to write about. Of course, all of this requires that you get to these folks early. Um, the longer the time period that someone has, the more likely they are to write you a very strong reference letter. If you ask with a day or so left before um, the before the reference letters are due, it's there is a, a there is a likely outcome that someone will write you a cursory a cursory letter, and those can be damaging. Um, you know, in many cases, the letters are all very strong, and that's helpful. In some cases, the letters are less strong, and that can be problematic. And then in some cases, the letters are just exceptionally strong, and that can be the differentiator between those who do go forward and those who don't go forward. So give people time, give them direction, give them the, the criteria that you wish to speak to. And then all of those things require that you remind the, the letter writer about what it is that is unique about you. And so include this summary of your work with your potential letter writers. Include examples of your leadership and how you were a mentor. Include information about yourself that they ought to know. Whenever someone asks me to write a letter of reference to uh, for admission into a graduate program, I always ask them to tell me five or 10 things about themselves that I might not know otherwise. Because what you want to have happen is you want the people who read the referee's letters to interpret them as knowing you well and being able to really provide a very strong assessment of the criteria that they're evaluating you against. And so when can someone can drop casually to say that, you know, they know that you are actively engaged in volunteering in your hometown in the summers during your undergraduate career, that adds some cre credibility to the letter writer. All right. So in general, get to them early, Help them understand what you hope to have them say about you. Give them the evidence that they need so that they can demonstrate um, that they are familiar with you and that they can speak to the criteria that they hope that you will address. One thing you do not want to do under any circumstances is you don't want to draft a letter for the referee. We've seen instances of this where we've seen the same letter from multiple referees that were already that were obviously written by the candidate, and then the referee just changes a few words. In the adjudication committee's opinion, those letters are disqualifying. We won't put a candidate through who's done that. And so if your referee asks you to draft the letter for you, and unfortunately that's happened, don't do that and move on to a different referee. It's perfectly appropriate for you to remind the referees of upcoming deadlines, so don't let the time pass and say, just reminding you that it's due tomorrow, you can say, just reminding you that it's due in a week and then remind you that it's due in three days and always say thank you. I know that this sounds silly, but saying thanks to the referee is an important outcome. Again, it demonstrates your, your gratitude for them for preparing a strong letter for you. So that's it on referees again. I hope that's helpful. Okay, when you are beginning to write about your research success thus far, if you have academic outputs, whether they are um, journal publications, whether they are conference proceedings, whether they are poster presentations, whether they are art displays. Um, 
we understand that there are different norms in different disciplines. And so if you are in a very applied discipline, let's say in the faculty of engineering, we might see that you have a, a relatively large number of publications or academic outputs. If you are in English, where there is um, where the norm of the publication discipline is to, to write a monograph, well, it's unlikely that after your undergraduate career or after your master's program that you've already written your first book. Now, if you have, that's fantastic. But we know and we have an expectation and we have the ability to normalize the, the expectation about the number of outputs um, that someone would have based on their on their academic discipline. So don't fear if you know of someone from engineering who's got 15 publications and you're in the humanities and you've got one. That's not problematic. What you ought to be doing when you are writing about your outputs is to tell us why those outputs are important. Um, one metric is citations. And if your writing has been cited, that's terrific. But if you have published a blog that has been read by a million people, that's also impactful. If you've written a governance document that has informed a new policy in the province of Ontario, that's also important. If you have mentored other students and you have jointly published with uh, another undergraduate student, that can be used as evidence of your mentorship. So publications don't all, don't necessarily don't only have to be about advancing scholarship. They can be about presenting you in a different light. One thing that is important is you differentiate between peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed. So if you have um, written lots on your own website, well, that's not peer-reviewed. It can be impactful, but it's not peer-reviewed. And there is a difference. If you have written things that were vetted by a, a team uh, or a set of peer reviewers, and they were published or, or allowed to be disseminated, then that I think speaks highly to the credibility of the scholarship. So peer reviewed journals, I think are the pathway or not just journals, sorry, peer reviewed work is the pathway for you to demonstrate others confirmation of your academic competencies. Many of you have professional experience and that's also important. And if you're going to talk about your professional experiences as a contribution, I think it's important for you to try to link that professional experience to your academic or your research activities. So if you are interested in maternal health and you have worked in hospital or in a clinic, or if you have worked in a homeless shelter and you are trying to support um, young mothers or those kinds of things, I think that's exactly the kind of evidence that will be useful for us to understand not only that you are working towards your personal and professional goals through academics, but also through your professional career. And when those align, that can be a really strong um, representation of yourself that becomes important. Oftentimes, the applications will ask you about your contributions. And what we normally like for you to do is to say, well, here is some evidence of the dissemination that I've done through my scholarship or the mentorship that I've done through my scholarship. And this is an important contribution because, and then that links the either the dissemination, the publication, the mentorship, the other work to an outcome, again, to advancing either your research discipline, advancing your scholarship, advancing the overall state of our understanding of the kind of work that you're doing, okay? So make sure you're always contemplating what is the linkage between this thing that I've done and its impact. That's what needs to be here in this section on the publications and the contributions. Many of these competitions allow for you to articulate special circumstances. And let me tell you what is intended by that. Um, suppose you have an undergraduate um, transcript that has your first two years, your average is 94, your third year in undergraduate, your average is 58, and in your fourth year, your average is 94 again. If your parents fell ill, if there was a financial disaster, if there was something that you had to deal with in that year that was a burden on you that created conditions that was making it more difficult for you to be successful, if there was an interruption in your academics because of something like that, that's what these special circumstances are for. If you had a parent illness, if you had a sibling illness, if you were unwell, 
if you were influenced by something that was happening around the world, if you were living in a country that was war torn, these are the places for you to, to let other people know that there were things that happened around you that influenced your ability to be successful. Now, what you don't want to do in this section is you don't want to say that I had a bad term because I was arguing with my supervisor, or I had a bad term because I was struggling with one course. This is not a special circumstance. What we are looking for here is to give special consideration to those things that were truly disruptive, that were unique to you, that were actually differentiable, and that ought to warrant some thoughtfulness on the reviewer's part to understand how that might have influenced your ability to have been successful. Okay, so use these special circumstances only in those unique cases where there is something that is genuinely impactful to you and genuinely unique to you that would have been seen as an interruptive, an interruption or certainly had a negative impact on your overall propensity for success. Okay, so what happens with um, your application once they get sent to us? We bring together six faculty associate deans graduate studies, and we have three people from graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs. Sometimes we bring in others, sometimes we don't. And all of the applications are read by two members, one from inside your faculty, one from outside of your faculty. And your application is scored by both of those um, readers. Now, what tends to happen is those with the highest scores, there tends to be, uh, let's use some, some generic numbers. Suppose we get 100 applicants, everyone gets read twice. So we read, um, those are 200 reads. And amongst those 200 reads, there will be, I would say of the 100, there'll be 20 that stand out as exceptional. And they move to the top of the pool. And those are normally considered to be going forward, whatever that means. Um, could be that you're winning the award or could be moving forward to the national competition. There will be 20 that are judged by the two readers as the weakest amongst the 100 that we have looked at. And then there are 60 that get scored and there is some hierarchy amongst the middle group. And then what happens is we come together and we have a conversation about each of these applications. And we try to decide what the rank order is of them. And some will move into the yes category, some will move into the no category. And then what happens is there is also what we call a reversion list. So those students who aren't immediately in the yes will be put on a hierarchical reversion list. And if someone for whatever reason who is a yes is going to decline the offer, then you move up into the yes category. And that's how we do that. And if there is a uh, an application that gets scored as amongst the highest by one reviewer and amongst the lowest by the other reviewer, we'll often engage a third reader to come in and, and provide an adjudication. So that's the way we do the internal application. We have a, a limited time. And really, again, back to writing a solid research proposal, it is important that you engage us, the review team, um, with, again, why it's important, tell us a good story, keep us engaged, keep us um, wanting to read the remainder of your proposal. Um, don't make it so dense that we can't read it. Um, make it so that we understand exactly the intent of the work that you're trying to do and that we grow confident that you can do that work. Okay, here are some resources for you. Um, I won't read all of these. Uh, I think this, this presentation will be available. Heidi and the team can confirm that but there are some sample proposals. There are scholarship instructions that are there. There are some competition resources. Um, we're doing some workshops we'll tell you some more about. I have already mentioned the Writing and Communication Center, and um, we have some experts in graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs that will be happy to help you navigate the administration of these awards. And speaking of which, here is the team. It's Miranda, Laura, Elena and Heidi, whom you've already met um, today, each of these look after an award. So Miranda is the CIHR and the SHRC person. Miranda, uh, sorry, Elena is the NSERC person. Laura looks after the OGS QE2. Heidi looks after Vanier and Heidi is the team lead for this group. So if you have questions about the competitions, about navigating the mechanics of the awards, these are the right folks to talk to. And 
I think that's it. I am happy to answer as many questions as there are. Clarence, as uh, Heidi has already told you, is already with us, uh, is with us too, if uh, I may call on him to help out with some of the answers from a social sciences um, point of view where he's expert, um, but happy to answer your questions. And again, I hope that was helpful. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeff. Really appreciate um, that very informative presentation. Again, um, for those of us who join late, Jeff is the chair of our Institutional Scholarship Selection Committee. Um, he's reviewed hundreds and hundreds of scholarship applications and um, a wealth of experience and knowledge. Jeff, I'll just give you a, a little pause here and I'll, I'm will i just gonna throw in some stats in case people are interested. Um, as you did hear, the scholarships are very important. Uh, it's very important that you apply for them just because if you are successful, these are, um, something that you can put on your CV as showing and demonstrating that you have been competitive if you're successful. Um, just to give you an idea though of the numbers of um, quotas that we receive uh, per competition as well as the number of applications, for the Canada Graduate Scholarship Master's uh, level scholarship, uh, for CIHR, we receive a quota of eight. NSERC, there's 48 and SHRC, there's 36. So for this competition, students are allowed to apply to three institutions in Canada where they want their application considered. And then it is an institutional competition. So at Waterloo, we're allowed to give um, eight awards for CIHR, 48 for NSERC, and 36 for SHRC. The um, tri-agency doctoral quotas for CIHR we are allowed to send forward a maximum of four. NSERC uh, doctoral is 115 and SHRC doctoral is 39. So uh, for the doctoral, it's a national level competition. So um, as an example, for CIHR, although we can send forward four, we usually receive about 20 applications for those university-wide and NSERC, we receive just under 130 applications for a quota of about 115. And for SHRC, we're about 100 applications university-wide and we can send forward 39. Um, for the OGS uh, and, sorry, OGS, we, we speak a lot in acronyms here uh, in our office. So it's the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, or OGS, as well as the Queen Elizabeth II Graduate Scholarship in Science and Technology. So that's QE2 GSST for short. It is the same competition. You apply using the same application. And for that particular one, we receive about 1,000 applications. Uh, for the fall 2022 competition, um, our quota uh, institutionally was 169 for OGS. Of those 169, five were awarded to international students. That's the maximum we can give out for international students. And then two are specifically reserved for applicants who identify as Canadian Indigenous students. And our quota for the Queen Elizabeth II um, Grad Scholarship in Science and Technology uh, was 37. Those are specifically intended for domestic students in the STEM disciplines. So again, you apply using the same application, uh, but your department ranks you, and then a decision is made as to whether you're going to get uh, an OGS or a QE2. All right, so Jeff, I'm going to swing over to some questions that have come in. Uh, some of them I'm kind of lumping together, and I think we'll start off with referees. Um, does the status of your referee make a difference? So in other words, getting a reference from a dean versus a new professor, um, is there any you know, influence or impact there? Um, maybe a, a very modest amount, Heidi. I, I would think that if, um, if you were getting a reference from an assistant prof um, who might say that you're the best student that they've worked with, um, but their history of, of supervision is relatively young, and, and so there's not a deep, very deep pool, that might carry slightly less weight than if you were getting a referee from a reference from um, someone who is a senior academic colleague, uh, maybe a dean who had supervised 50 or 60 students, um, maybe that would, would be the difference. Um, but I, I think that shouldn't be the deciding factor. Um, the deciding factor ought to be who's really in a better spot to know you well and to be able to provide that kind of 
really honest and in-depth assessment of your of your strengths. Um, so in a case where where both the dean and the new faculty member um, had a, the similar understanding of your performance, sure, it'd be great to have the dean write that letter. But if the new faculty member knows you much better, can comment better on your on your strengths than the dean might, um, I think that would be better. I, I would just say that um, I don't think any of us would read a tepid letter from the dean um, and say, oh, well, it's from a dean, so it's better. I don't think we would say that. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, another one on referees as well. So somebody just started their master's program this fall. Uh, their lab is very small, mainly just their supervisor, lab coordinator, and, them, and themselves. And they want to know how they could go about meeting more faculty members so they can broaden their pool of potential referees for their scholarship applications. A any suggestions there? Sure, I'll, I'll offer a couple of thoughts and then maybe Clarence wants to, wants to jump in as well. Um, you know, we... This is a more general uh, comment than just on, on scholarships, but we are always eager for our students to have a committee that they're working with. The supervisory relationship is super important, but having other faculty members who are ultimately going to be both adjudicators of your work, either as a reader on a master's thesis or just can, who can help contribute to your work, um, it's a really good idea. And of course, uh, part of graduate school is, is networking and getting to know a few more faculty members and get to know students from other research groups is a really good idea. So I think you ought to have a conversation with your supervisor, ask them about other faculty members that they regularly work with who might share a common interest in the work that you're doing. Um, invite that faculty member to coffee and, and have a chat about your work and, and get them excited about the work that you're doing. And then if that relationship proves fruitful, then, then there's an opportunity to engage them as a referee as well. Parents, anything to add there? Well, just to reiterate the, that importance of uh, getting engaged with your community, that scholarly community. So if there's opportunities for, you know, public lectures within your department, um, you know, part of the value of attending them is, is not just obviously learning from the content, but it's the fact that you're being seen, you're connecting with people. Um, and as Jeff suggested, that's a chance for you to have that conversation, uh, talk about your interests in your work, um, and make that important connection that you can then sort of work towards uh, ultimately perhaps using them in, in this kind of a context, applying for scholarship. Great. Thank you both very much. Uh, I'm going to flip over to a topic on uh, research proposals here. Um, who are the readers that applicants should be targeting and what is their familiarity with the subject matter? Yeah, so that evolves through the research proposal. Um, so let me let me try to explain it this way. Um, if we go back to the martini glass, um, anybody who picks up your research proposal in the first paragraph ought to understand what is the mouth of that martini glass? What is the area that you're working in? Is it sustainable energy? Is it health? Is it um, environment? Is it, um, is it quantum mechanics? Um, and, and, and what is the, the social, economic, environmental, what is the relevance of the work that you're doing? So anybody picks up that ought to be able to do that. And someone who has a moderate background. I'm an engineer uh, by my training. And so I think I ought to be able to read through the first three quarters of a of, uh, an engineering proposal and understand conceptually all the work that's going to be done. And then when you get into that very deep stem of the, of the martini glass, that ought to be dedicated to people who are in your discipline, in your field. It shouldn't exclude people who have a, a basic understanding, but it should be targeted so that we have a confidence that we know that you have the expertise to do that. And then again, back to the base of the martini glass, the big bottom, that ought to be accessible to everybody. So as you think about your proposal, make sure that you can engage as many readers as you can. And then as you move down into the into the very details of your work, the methods, the, um, the data collection, the interpretation, the analysis, the actual things that you're going to do, that can be targeted at a narrower narrower population, those who have a, a, some understanding of the work that you're doing, some understanding of your specific discipline. And then the, the, the outcomes and the impact, again, ought to be accessible to the lay audience. So um, there's no one audience that you're trying to reach. Um, if everything is written at that very lay, publicly accessible, then we lose confidence in your ability to do the work. If everything is written at a technical level that is so in-depth, 
that we can't understand the importance of your work, then you lose the ability for us to situate your work relative to its impact. So you've got to get that balance right. Great. Thank you. And somebody else is asking a question. Uh, they're dealing with an abstract research topic and ideas that are not necessarily very relevant to society. How do you propose writing a proposal on these types of topics, both as a story and showing impact on society? Yeah, that's always the most challenging one, I think. Um, you know, I, my friends in Pure Math, uh, I talk with them often and and I encourage them to tell me about the impact. And they say, we don't do things for impact. We do it because it is an exploration of mathematics. And that's important. Um, I think that there are always examples of where the kind of work that you've done has in the past laid the foundation for important work that comes forward later. Um, our colleague, Donna Strickland, who won the Nobel Prize here five years ago, won the Nobel Prize for laser pulse work that she did back in the, I think the 1980s um, as part of her graduate program. Um, and just to fast forward uh, 35 years, my wife had a, a, a small tear in her retina and you know what they use? Laser pulse technology to heal that, that tear in the retina. And so I think when, when Donna Strickland was doing the work on laser pulse, she was doing fundamental abstract kind of research and probably couldn't foresee that this was going to become a healthcare tool. But that kind of evidence that's happened in the past is often a parallel to what you're in the long term where your work might go. So if you're doing something abstract, it is okay, I think, to offer a parallel to say, you know, previous explorations in this sort of area have produced these kinds of societal outcomes, even if it's unclear to you where your work might go. I think that's helpful because if it is simply abstract, it is, honestly, it's just difficult for us to get our head around um, around why this ought to be funded versus someone who is, for example, dealing with, with a, a topic that might lead to a cancer breakthrough or, or something like that. So that's that's my bit of advice. I don't know, Clarence, if you have some other thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge, again, of, of trying to take that abstract idea and somehow find a link that that our reader, an evaluator can look at it and kind of see that connection. Um, you know, using a parallel, using a, a complementary example to illustrate the potential, I think uh, may work in those instances as well. Um, so it's just trying to be creative and how you especially set the tone right at the beginning of that proposal, I think, is where you can establish that and then get in, as Jeff described, get into the details that would be more discipline specific, more detailed. Maybe I could just build a little bit more, Heidi, just to say that um, if you're doing something that is abstract and unique and um, I suspect you're doing that because you have a passion for it. There's something that really engages you in that work. Maybe you find these um, novel geometries. Maybe you find this quantum movement. Maybe you find the writings of Shakespeare in a certain period in time um, to be enormously interesting. And if you help the reader understand where your passion is situated, that also can be really helpful. It can't be, you know, half a page of that, but it can be a few sentences that get, that convey your enthusiasm for this. And then we'll share your enthusiasm as we read it, even if the linkages are less clear than there might be in other disciplines. Great, thank you. I'll ask one more question on the research proposal now, and then uh, I'll flip over to some questions on publications. So can you clarify the difference between the lay abstract and the research proposal or outline? Um, the applicant here understands the importance of the two, but can you elaborate a bit more on the difference between them and how um, they go about writing them up separately? Yeah. So. I think that as you write your research proposal, let's start there. And you're gonna start again at the top of the martini glass and you're gonna talk about the overall area that you're trying to work in. And you're gonna narrow, continue to narrow that down to your unique focus. That top of the martini glass and that narrowing to your focus is what ought to, ought to be represented in the lay abstract. So really, what is the big picture problem that you're trying to solve? How are you uniquely going to look at that big picture? you might be able to synthesize all of the methods and all of the work that you're going to do into one or two sentences um, in the lay abstract rather than the, the page or whatever it will be in your, in your research proposal. And then the bottom of that martini glass, the impact, that belongs almost fully in the lay abstract. So at the end of the day, when you're done your research, what are we going to benefit from? And that's what gets people excited about the lay abstract. So the lay abstract is the top of the martini glass, two or three sentences, 
maybe one or two sentences on the specific methods written in a way that a lay reader can understand, and then two sentences that are on the bottom of that martini glass that is talking about the dissemination and the impact. Great. And I think it's also important to um, not copy and paste text Absolutely from one not. to the other, because we've recently seen that in some applications. Um, okay. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, I just saw yes. Clarence uh, wanted to say something as well. Well, yeah, I did. and on the point about the jargon and technical language as well, I mean, I think sometimes people struggle with, you know, how do I take, you know, these technical terms around, you know, quantum computing, et cetera, and then make it uh, part of the lay abstract. I mean, often you can use just one sentence to make that translation for, the, you know, the individual uh, that's reading it so that they understand where your complex idea fits in sort of this base broader understanding that, you know, anyone could pick up and look at it and go, oh yeah, I get it. It's part of the computing, you know, complex or something like that. So um, often I see that in, in lay abstracts that there's an effort made to kind of do that initial translation to make it more accessible. Yeah, that's a terrific point, Clarence. I think if you can say, I mean, I don't know, let's use something fairly, fairly specific. Um, in my field, we talk about um, logit models, which are ways that people, we mathematically represent the way that people make decisions amongst a set of alternatives that have different attributes. And so I can talk about, you know, the um, the conditions, the mathematical or statistical conditions that need to be in place in order for that logit model to hold true. But if you were to write in a lay abstract to say that we present respondents with some options around their travel choices and the way in which they choose those things allow us to derive, to interpret different values of different attributes. That's a, a lay translation of a technical tool that really demonstrates your understanding and keeps the reader involved in the work that you're doing. And so that's exactly the kind of stuff that I think that you need to put into your lay abstract, translate complexity into something that is manageable for the lay reader. Great, great suggestion, thank you. Okay, so flipping over to publications, um, several questions have come in, sort of same idea. Um, somebody has an interest in applying for grad scholarships and their field is very prolific, so they don't have any peer reviewed publications, you know, somebody just starting out, they really don't have publications yet, or their field just doesn't publish as part of their program. How do they navigate that? And, and is that sort of a deal breaker? And how would they compare competitive wise, you know, to other other scholars? Yeah, so I'll answer practically and then more strategically. Uh, on the practical side, we would expect someone who is applying, for example, for a doctoral scholarship who is in their um, second year of their doctoral program, um, we would normalize where they were in their program relative to their research outputs. And so if you are um, finishing your undergrad and applying for a master's program or just finishing your master's program in a discipline that we're in which master's students don't normally publish, um, and we wouldn't expect you to have the same output as someone who is in a doctoral program in an area where publishing is prolific. So, so we, we have a sense of that your, your associate dean graduate studies helps us understand what the relative expectations are amongst the discipline and amongst your state and your career. Now, the other element, though, is that what we're really trying to assess here is your capacity for research and your research strengths, also your academic strengths. And so there are ways to demonstrate that without publishing. Um, and so if you work with a, a faculty member and you were a part of a team that created some output, even if your name didn't end up on the output, but you were you were important behind the scenes, well, maybe your name should have been on the output, but, but there are ways to demonstrate that you have research skills, you have research competencies, you have research knowledge, you have research potential. Those can be undergraduate theses, those can be major research papers that you've written as part of your undergraduate program, those can be your master's thesis, even if it doesn't lead to publications. But let me say this. I think that the key thing to demonstrate that you are have high potential as a researcher is that you are able to take a problem that is complex, you are able to articulate that problem, break it down into segments that you can address, and then that you have demonstrated that you have worked on some component. And depending on where you are in your stage of your academics, you may have done that as part of a thesis, you may have done that as part of a course project, you may have done that as a undergraduate student research associate for NSERC or SHRC or others. 
Um, and so there are lots of ways to demonstrate you have that competency without having publications. So don't get hung up on the number of the publications. Concentrate on, on ways that you can demonstrate that you have the potential and the experience to be successful as a researcher. Thank you. Anything to add there, Clarence? Well, I think the uh, quite often, again, if you look at the particular requirements for the scholarship application around research, I mean, obviously, as Jeff mentioned, peer-reviewed publications are sort of the high standard of of output in that in that realm. But there are other ways that you can demonstrate research engagement and and activity. For example, whether it's presentations or uh, perhaps you know through a work placement where there was a, a research activity undertaken. So if you're given the opportunity to to include that in your um, your CV or resume or to articulate that some way uh, within the proposal, then um, don't undervalue those opportunities that can say something about your your research skills and acumen. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and this is where a referee could be really helpful. Um, you know, if you um, were in a course and there was a paper to be written, and you came with a really novel idea about about how to write something about the course paper and it was well received by a referee, you might remind that referee that you had done that. And they can then speak to the fact that, you know, that you were able to structure this question, structure this research, structure this, this investigation in a way that really was impressive to them as a researcher. And even if it hasn't led to a dissemination, again, having them observe that you've structured problems and been able to address them in that meaningful way can be enough to demonstrate your research potential. Great. Okay, we have a question about EDI. If the uh, research proposal is on an equity deserving group, um, as someone who is a part of that group, what exactly do they need to emphasize in the EDI section? Uh, in other words, like, are they talking about how their work is beneficial for the group or how it addresses common research concerns that that group often experience? Uh, I think, yes, Heidi, both those things are important. I think that what the um, funding agencies are looking for are that people are, uh, I, I'll say three things, I think. Um, I think that the, the tri-agencies are looking for one, that if you're going to explore a question and it has a potential to shed light on an EDI issue, you ought to do that. So if you are talking about maternal health in Canada and you don't ask the question about whether or not that's different for Indigenous people, for Black people, or for those, uh, or for non-racialized people. Um, the committee may wish to understand why you have chosen not to investigate those that differentiation. Okay, that's the first thing. So if you're going to explore something that has a potential EDI, you ought to do it explicitly, or you ought to explain why you're not. And it's perfectly fine not to do it if that's outside of the scope of your work, but you ought to address that. And, the second is that the agencies want to know that you are well prepared to be thoughtful, considerate, respectful, all of those things in the kind of work that you're doing. And so if you are not Indigenous and you intend to do Indigenous work, you ought to be very well prepared to do work in a way that is consistent with Indigenous traditions and beliefs and ways of knowing and so on. And you need to be able to demonstrate that. The third is, I think, that if you are going to do work in that space that involves equity-deserving groups, you ought to be able to articulate what the benefits might be to those equity-deserving groups. And so if you are going to do an exploration of maternal health and you are going to look explicitly at Indigenous versus non-Indigenous people in a specific geographic area, you ought to be able to say that the outcomes will include potential guidance on local investments towards maternal health gains for those in both communities. So you ought to be able to demonstrate that the problem you're addressing has an EDI component and you either are or not doing that. In the cases that you are, you're going to do it respectfully, thoughtfully, and consistent with the expectations of the group you're studying. And the third thing is you ought to be able to demonstrate the benefits to the group that you are studying. Thank you. That was very thorough. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as a PhD student who is just starting out, they're still figuring out their research topic. Um, do you recommend waiting to completing their the first year and then applying for a scholarship? I think part well, of that a... also depends on eligibility because for these scholarships, you um, there's a certain number of months that you cannot have completed more than, um, and that's all based on timing. And each of the scholarships have um, 
different criteria around that, but otherwise, yeah. Can you speak to that, Jeff? Yeah, let's assume eligibility is not a, not a concern. Um, th there's two ways to think about this. One is to think that, yeah, I'll be better off if I have a year under my belt. The topic will be better structured. I may have demonstrated academic success in graduate school. I may have better relationships with a set of referees. Um, I may have a dissemination or two or three that are um, farther along than they are right now. All those things can be benefits to waiting. On the flip side, going through this process of writing a research proposal is an enormously valuable exercise in and of itself. And if you were to write out your research proposal now, it might prompt you to give some pretty substantive thinking about what the thesis might be going forward. Um, and if you get into the habit of thinking structurally about your work and really articulating it in a way that can be followed, that's a great skill set to have. And I can say, um, and maybe I shouldn't be as candid as I will be in just a second, but nobody goes back to check to see that you've actually done what you're going to say, what you say you're going to do in the research proposal. And so if you write the research proposal and it's really well written and it's thoughtful and it's believable and there's a clear trajectory and you're the right person to do the work and you're given that award and then in year two things change a little bit and you go left when you thought you were going to go right it's quite okay that does that doesn't make anybody nervous i think that um really there's there's a skill set so i think you could go either way um i would always recommend going through this process now and then if you feel like you don't have a good set of referees, if you don't have a clear vision, then maybe you pull the plug. But if you begin the process, you get get through it, and you feel like you've got a structure and a committee and a group that can support you, then I would recommend that you do it now. I see Clarence wants to say something. Well, just the comment on, on where you are in the program as well. Don't forget that in terms of from an evaluation, we're comparing you to uh, peers at same stage. So, I mean, if you're, again, going into your doctoral, then the comparison is students going into the doctoral, not in the fourth year of their doctorate. So um, that's something that, you know, may help remove some of that that anxiety. Um, and Jeff's absolutely right. Like the the process and skill of writing research proposals uh, is something that I guess as academics, I mean, uh, I was just on a call this morning, for example, where we have, you know, a conversation about an opportunity that's arisen. We have three weeks to respond. Uh, you need to be able to then craft this, uh, you know, well-written and worded proposal that's defensible, et cetera. So, I mean, it is something that um, uh, I think is a, an exceptional skill that uh, that students should work on. So. Thanks. I just also wanted to add one little caveat about um, if you're not sure what you want to write about, um, you can write it, develop it as best you can. And if you're successful, if you if you change gears partway through, um, that's fine. As long as your research still falls under the mandate of the agency under which you were awarded the scholarship. So um, we do. That is a, a frequently asked question, actually, uh, especially yeah. amongst um, students who are just starting out. So thank you. If you uh, uh, if you switch from computer science to understanding the um, the cultural implications of Shakespeare, um, NSERC may not be so thrilled about about funding that Shakespeare. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of academic leadership, could you please share a few examples? So does working as a head TA for various undergrad courses count as leadership experience, or volunteering instructing at nonprofit organizations? From the funding applications perspective, how do these experiences contribute to the application and convince the committee that one deserves the funding? Yeah, that's a terrific question. I'm glad someone asked that. Um, leadership is really important, increasingly important. You know, again, when we're in an era where we are looking at applications that all have very high marks, that all have typically some previous research experience, that referees are saying that these are very strong students, there are leadership often becomes the differentiating factor. Not always, but it, it's it has happened that leadership becomes a differentiating factor. And so what we're really looking for is evidence that you have adopted roles that allowed you to be impactful for your academic discipline. And so all the things that you mentioned, Heidi, working in a, a nonprofit, again, that is somehow related to your area of scholarship, serving as a head TA in a giant course, that's also very important. Um, lecturing, mentoring your peers, um, 
organizing conferences, all of these are ways to demonstrate that not only do you have an, an interest and a passion, but you've taken action to advance the discipline. And you've done that through your own leadership. Um, so I, I, I encourage um, our applicants to think carefully about how they can present themselves in that setting. Um, things that aren't leadership that sometimes get put into those categories, um, things like getting non-merit-based awards. Um, you know, we sometimes see that um, students write that they got the International Doctoral Student Award. Um, well, every PhD student, every international PhD student at Waterloo gets that award. And so when you are highlighting the strengths of your candidacy, those are things that you ought to be cognizant of. Great, thank you. Uh, just as an aside, I do see that somebody has raised their hand. Um, we don't actually have that functionality working, so please go ahead and just ask your question in the Q&A um, section at the bottom of your screen. Thanks. Uh, okay, just a couple more questions, and then it looks like we're actually going to be wrapping up well ahead of schedule. Um, so somebody's asking, what if they don't, uh, what if they have not published enough due to patenting in progress? Is there a spot where they could mention that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, again, you, this is, this is a little bit tricky. Um, there is, there's often instructions on these, um, on these application files to say, you know, what is published, what is under review, and then students often will include working papers in their, in their list. And, you know, as a reviewer, I tend not to pay too much attention to the working papers because we all have working papers that are that are started um, that haven't yet got out into the review chain. But if you are working on things and you are in the midst of a patent application and that patent application is precluding the publication of some things, but those working papers are in place and the patent application is underway. Um, and there can be other reasons. You know, you might sign a non-disclosure agreement with a research partner. You might have data that the research partner requires that they have a certain period of time to vet or that there's a um, an embargo on, on sharing things. Those are things that you can offer. Um, you can write them as working papers and then your referees can comment that those things are, comment on what the holdup is to those working papers. Um, that's the right way to present that information is for your supervisor or your referee to say, um, we have six papers in queue that as soon as the embargo is lifted, will go out for review, or we have three papers that are in queue, or and it's all being held up by the patent application. The referee can verify that um, in their letter. Great. Okay, uh, two more questions here. Um, back to referees, um, and it's probably a repeat, but maybe it's important just to um, respond again. Uh, somebody just started their master's program. Would you recommend my referees come from my undergrad uh, because they know me better, or should I try to get to know the profs in my master's to get their reference instead? Yeah, I'll go back to the, I mean, I think the, the fundamental principle here is the referee should know you well. Um, I often discount the, um, you know, when we get the um, the letters, if the master's supervisor says, this is the best student I've ever worked with, but they've only known the student for two months, it's very difficult for me to find credibility in that, in that statement, right? Because you don't know how that's actually going to work out. So stick with the people who know you well. And yes, thank you. And that goes uh, regardless of what institution they're from. We get asked about whether it can come from um, a previous institution, even if it was outside of Canada, Canada, that's totally fine. It, as long as they can speak to the criteria under which you're being evaluated and can provide a strong letter of support, that's that's totally fine. Clarence, did you want to add something? Just the, the standard uh, prompts for us as reviewers when we're writing these letters, it's uh, how long have you known the student and in what capacity and what is the comparison group, right? So so right away, if you're asking about, you know, I just started my master's program at, at University of Waterloo. I've known somebody for a month and a half. Should I ask them for a reference letter? Again, um, comparably speaking, that's probably not going to be as advantageous as someone you've worked with for a number of years from your undergraduate that knows you really well, as Jeff said. So just important to keep that in mind. Great, thanks. Okay, and a final question back to publications. Um, somebody has a, uh, a pretty specific question um, 
because it pertains to their field. They're wondering if you have any advice for fine arts applicants in demonstrating their research output and skills through, through their contributions. Are there any tips to demonstrating their research to the Waterloo Selection Committee? Yeah, so fine arts is often in this situation, architecture can have different kinds of output. The School of Planning where Clarence is um, can have different kinds of outputs. Um, and as an institutional selection criteria, we try to be very respectful of the discipline. And if we're not clear on, on what the impact or what the um, strength of the dissemination is, we will often have the associate dean reach out locally to find out more about, about what that actually means. And so if you've had a curated exhibit, if you've been invited to demonstrate your work, if you've um, if there is some evidence that you are being sought after in terms of showing your work, I think that's really important. If you are able to translate what your work means in terms of social commentary in terms of political commentary and whatever it is that you're trying to achieve through your art. I think that's important for us to understand. And if you can link that to the places where your art's been seen or shown or displayed, I think that's really helpful. So again, it's it's not about the citations um, associated with it. It's not about what journal it's in and its impact factor. It's about how we have evidence that your research is resonating with the audience that it's intended to be resonating with. And so, again, if that's been exhibits, if that's been curated, if that's been invitations, if that's been high profile displays, if that's been invited talks um, um, through poetry or whatever it is, I think that, that, that we want to understand what the impact of that is. And again, if we can't know what that is already just from, from um, our own understanding, then we will seek out more information. Great. Okay. So Jeff or Clarence, I'm just going to open it up. Do you have any final words of wisdom as we um, close this webinar today? You want to go first, Clarence, and then I'll, and I'll close things up if um, you want to offer a couple of thoughts and then I'll, I'll, I'll say um, a few things at the end. Yeah. I mean, I guess if I would offer uh, some advice from somebody that uh, has probably read over the course of my career, probably safe to say thousands of reference letters, um, I would say on the reference letter standpoint, it's already been said a number of times, but really um, I can read a letter and I can, I can gauge the nature of the relationship just based on what I see in the letter, how well a faculty member knows a student. Um, and the ones that always carry the most impact are the ones that are genuine in terms of, you know, you, you know that they know one another as opposed to, um, again, kind of uh, only tangentially or, or in passing. So um, it's a challenge for students uh, because I think, and, and certainly the, the past three years have been challenging in the sense that, uh, you know, remote learning and, and the pandemic uh, learning experience has not been great for building those kinds of relationships. So I certainly empathize with students in that challenge of, of trying to find those references um, but I think that's really important. Um, and again, on the proposal, um, it is a lot of work. Um, I find them a lot of work today. It's like, you know, the thought of writing a proposal is, is always daunting, um, you know, but I you know encourage you to stick with it, work together with a, a peer or a friend that, you know, you can help each other out and bounce ideas off one another, but uh, it's tough work, but uh, the payoff is, is really important. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, Clarence. Yeah, so I'll just end with this. A um, couple of thoughts. One is that this is actually a really important learning out learning process for you. I think um, I've said it a couple of times, but even if you're not successful, um, even if you don't get this fully complete and get it submitted, going through this exercise of trying to think through in a very rational way the work that you want to do, what are the steps, what are the processes, what are the dependencies amongst the elements in your work, and what are going to be the important outcomes that you take away from your work? This is incredibly a, a rich exercise for you to do, um, no matter what happens with the scholarship program. We do encourage you to apply. I think it's super important. Um, again, as Heidi had mentioned and I mentioned, there is real confirmation, real, um, it elevates your CV having held these kinds of awards, regardless of the financial outcomes of this. When you write that research proposal, write us a narrative that we can believe in, write us a narrative that we can follow, write us a, a narrative that we have the balance between understanding what it is you're doing and why it's important and your strength of scholarship, why you are the unique person to do the work that you're doing. 
we're really excited to read these things. It's actually one of the, the most fun things that we do um, to read and, and learn about what our, our colleagues are doing, what our students are doing, how impactful they, they really are. So um, we'll look forward to getting your application. Thanks for coming today. Great. Thank you. Okay, everyone, this concludes our webinar. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to both um, Jeff and Clarence for the insightful presentation and addressing so many questions, as well as to my uh, GSPA colleagues who are assisting behind the scenes, and to everyone who attended, thank you. Uh, if you do have any follow-up questions, please reach out to your department coordinator or grad officer, associate chair, or your supervisor for any assistance. And finally, a recording of the presentation will be posted to our scholarship competition resources webpage within the next week. On this page, you will also find details about our future events and supports. Thanks for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone.